Good evening all and welcome. Before the video begins, I have a quick announcement. To anyone who signs up to my $10 tier on Patreon is going to get all these gifts sent to them in the mail. All these stickers, including your favorite cryptids, Deban, Bigfoot, Skinwalker, Black Eyed Kid, and the whole cryptid crew right there. Mortis Media stickers and a Let the Darkness Take Control one. Two for good measure, a bunch of them, not just once, as well as a special message from me on a postcard that I probably made myself straight to you. Something fun to keep. Also, a bunch of extra stuff is on Patreon, like an 18-minute narration I just made on there quite recently, and loads of other bonus content that you'll probably enjoy. If this is something that you like, feel free to check it out. Link in the top of the description, and if not, that's cool too. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the boundary waters in northern Minnesota slash Ketiko, southern Ontario. There are massive wilderness areas of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts and we were based on Moose Lake on the US side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip, anywhere from seven to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical but one expedition in particular still haunts me as the result of what happened to us over the course of a few days. Here is the full account. My crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult supervisors or scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability so we had to amend our route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddy Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare. But that decision would end up putting us in the path of... something. We visited the falls and camped near to it. That evening I had the boys work on a camp set up while the advisors worked on fire for dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of downed trees, brush and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left when out of nowhere I hear the most unearthly scream slash roar I've ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks and I was frozen. The second scream was closer and the third closer still. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this thing was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got nauseous and involuntarily barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body. The fifth scream almost physically hurt, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran back to camp. My crew had heard it too. But what am I to tell them? I claimed it was a boar. There's no boars up there, and the advisors knew I was lying but didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents and I retired to my hammock about 50 yards from the camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock at head height, so about six feet up. I was used to a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off the mosquitoes, but the tarp wasn't strung up. That was important. It was just loosely over me. It must have been around 3 or 4 a.m. when I was awoken by what sounded like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I heard something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen, totally still and quiet, as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from brush to granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked through the camp and on towards me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing, and I don't know what to do. In no time, it was standing right next to me. I could hear it breathing, loud and congested. I could smell the musk. I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body just standing there. Time to make a decision. I threw off the top from my head and did this as my left hand touched the thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The musculature was impressive. Bodybuilder status, pectorals is what I touched. It happened in a second. As soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. 
By the time I got my headlamp on, it was gone. My crew had slept through it all, so I read until the sun came up and decided not to mention it. The next day, we moved on a few miles towards base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the US side are designated by a fire pit and a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole. We were just arriving, and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper, so he walked towards it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling as he came running back to camp, still pulling his pants up and said that he'd seen a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if maybe it was a bear, and he said it absolutely was not. He'd hunted bears for years, and it was no bear. It was a monkey, and it was around nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I imagine being back in my hammock. If I'd have touched the chest and I was six feet off the ground, that puts its head close to nine feet up. Was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys were now scared. Time to mitigate. I suggested a night paddle. No one's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack up and set out around 8 p.m. and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back on Moose Lake and camp very near to base so that we could be the first crew off the water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfound Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep nor wide. There are dark woods on both sides and we were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and narrowly missed the bow of the canoe I was steering. This thing was forcefully throwing things at us from the tree line. At this, we paddled like hell. We paddled to the center of Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together and sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp and ended our expedition. They did not want to talk about what happened and I was okay with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area we had been in, Bear Loop, and I was helping him put a boat on the rack when I noticed he had a distant, almost thousand yard stare sort of look. I asked him how his trip went and he said it was all good until they hit Knife Lake slash Newfound Lake. He said they were being messed with for two nights on Knife, and they had a rock thrown at them in Newfound Pinch. Sure enough, for a solid two weeks after the crews kept coming back from that area, they all had very similar stories. One night, there was a crowd of us guides in the staff lodge swapping trail stories, and these encounters came up one after another. Screams, rocks, Sightings of apes? Then from the back corner of the room I heard a chuckle. It was one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade. All he said was, it's about time someone else seen one. I asked how long he'd known they were there and he said he's been encountering them for 10 years. Then he said, they talked to me. It shocked me, what like language? Nah, they communicate telepathically. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you, and they like it when you're afraid. It's a game to them. What happened out there is still a very big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never really a huge stretch for me. But what really sticks with me is the way the veteran guides spoke of their intelligence and parapsychological abilities, that they can read human emotions as clear as the pages in a book, that they know our species better than we know ourselves. Years ago, me and my cousin hung out a lot, drinking and smoking and playing video games. He lived in the last house on the right, down the dead end road in an area where it was somewhat suburban and somewhat country. He had a river run right behind his house. It wasn't huge, but had a decent current. And on the other side of the river, there was a small island and a river on the other side of that. It was shaped a bit like a triangle. One day he calls me and tells me to come over and hang out, as he was scared, and I asked him what happened. He began telling me that his dog was freaking out the night before by growling and snarling and barking. Usually this dog was dead silent, unless she had to go out and then she would whine a little. 
He said he kept hearing splashes while he was outside, like someone was throwing rocks into the water. And before the splashing, his dog began freaking out. So I go over there. We're hanging outside our back, smoking a cigarette and talking. His dog starts sniffing around like crazy and then looks at the island and goes nuts. Me and him turn on our phone's flashlight and start checking out the island to see if we could see anything. We're scanning the island back and forth and we both go, Bro, did you see that? A big ass pair of red eyes was staring at us and I remember we just froze and crapped bricks. So the island is pretty much the same level as his backyard and these eyes were at least four to five feet in the air. We proceed to watch these eyes raise about eight or nine feet above the ground, and both of us got nervous thinking it was a bear. What was this thing? The eyes then vanished, and we heard the thing move around the island heavily. His dog began whimpering and whining, and out of nowhere, huge rocks started being thrown at us, like stones the size of pumpkins hitting the water and for the next hour and a half we heard this thing move back and forth through the trees and throwing things into the water. And then suddenly it just stopped and went silent. I must mention that this house is old as hell, and we're pretty sure it's haunted because it constantly sounds like someone is slamming doors and stomping around the house, when it would just be me and him and the doors would be locked. We also heard faint talking there when no one else was in the house. To this day we don't know what it was. We initially thought it was a bear because there were a few bear sightings in the area, but how would a bear throw many boulders into the water like that? There were no bear sounds either. It was completely silent out that night with no birds, no frogs and no crickets. Safe to say, we were both terrified, and it's a night neither of us will ever forget in a hurry. The following events happened at 5 p.m. on the west coast of Sweden. Given the time, and it being winter, the darkness had nearly taken control, when my dad and I went for a walk in a forest that was perhaps a 10-minute stroll from civilization, and without any light assistance. There were no street lights or flashlights involved. We saw the trail fairly clearly, though, as we often took walks together and were very familiar with it. We were right next to a lake, and we noticed a big group of maybe 50 ducks chilling in the water near the beach, when out of nowhere, about 25 meters away from us, a creature ran from across the trail from left to right and continued down towards the lake. They quickly vanished out of sight. I'd say it was at least a meter and a half tall and on four legs, although funnily enough, the front legs appeared longer than the hind legs a bipedal creature running on all fours, beige or brown, and a really fast runner. It made no noise except the sound of running. All the ducks in the lake began freaking out and started flying and screaming, which feels like weird behavior if it was just a deer running past. Just after the creature ran past, a very heavy smell of iron permeated the air. Both of us could smell it. It smelled like blood. I've never experienced a smell like that before, and I work in a hospital and deal with blood often. Personally, I'm fascinated by these events and definitely believe in different possibilities, but my dad is a hardcore skeptic, realist and science-loving man. He grew up on a farm in the middle of Sweden's forest and is very familiar with Swedish wildlife. He says he's never seen anything with that shape before or anything move that fast. We don't have many big mammals here at all really, and the closest possibility is a deer, but they usually never come that close to people and I've never seen one move that fast. And all their legs are roughly the same size of course, not like this thing that seemed to have a significantly larger upper body. Me and my dad went back to the exact site the day after and checked for tracks. We were sort of expecting a trail of blood since that would be a logical explanation for the smell but there was none whatsoever, and the layer of snow on the ground was the same as the night before, so I thought it would be easy to spot. The snow gave us the ability to see hoof tracks very clearly though. My dad is a hunter, so I trust his judgment on the matter, and we also did a lot of research on the tracks and asked other hunters in the family afterwards. The only big mammals we have in southern Sweden are deer, hog and elk. 
It was definitely not an elk. The thing we saw was smaller than an elk calf. The tracks weren't from a pig or hog, as they have four distinct toes. The shape was similar to that of a deer hoof print, but much larger. This thing was twice the size for regular deer tracks. Once again, we continued our research. Going back and checking made us even more confused about the event. The lack of blood makes the smell even more mysterious, and the tracks that don't fit any animal just add to the disturbing nature and question what the hell we saw that night. In my 20s, I was up north in Quebec, Canada bush, way deep into it, in order to go fishing. To give you some context, the lake is in northern Quebec, about nine hours from Ottawa, which involved three hours of highway driving until you turn into the bush for six hours of off-roading. So as you can imagine, it's deep into the bush, and you can't bring a boat. A few 10-foot aluminium boats were dropped on the shore from helicopters years ago, and we use those. So if something bad happens, basically, you're screwed. The boat was near the shore drifting along the water as I jigged. It's the dead of summer. With no wind, it's hot but quiet as hell. My friend snoozed at the front of the boat as we fished for hours. I looked up by the water, and about 25 feet there was this weird as hell animal that I will never forget. It was like a hairless, ugly, wrinkled alien marsupial. It likely thought I was alone for miles, because the sound it made was 100% natural. The thing I saw looked like a cross between salacious crumb, which is Jabba the Hutt's ugly little pet, and the elephant man. That's the only way I can describe it. It was the size of a six to seven year old child and perched on a dead tree stump when I first saw it. It was doing something with its hands, possibly cleaning itself. It was very creepy in the way it moved. Sort of animal, but humanoid too. I was mesmerized for a few minutes as the boat drifted towards the shore. I couldn't move. The thing had zero sense that someone else was around until the boat finally ran aground softly, and that is when it took off. It took off, stopped, looked back, and took off again. I felt its intelligence was more than that of an animal. This happened, and I will never forget. My cousin and I used to play outside in the middle of the night. This happened when we were around 14. Since I lived close to a 24-7 PD, we'd grab our Nerf guns and pretend to have a mission of some sort. And on this particular day, our mission was to find three Coke cans around the neighborhood while shooting every car we saw. We ended up on a little parking lot between two houses. There we found the last Coke can on the trash, and the mission was over. While heading back home, in one of the gaps between the houses, sort of like an alley, we heard movement. So we both looked at it and pointed our Nerf gun flashlights, and I swear on everything I know, right there, in the corner crouched and humped, was a pale, skinny, naked creature. It had no fur or any visual cues that would indicate what it was. After the two of us shining the flashlight at it, the thing turned to us very fast and started getting up slowly. At this point I was frozen in fear. It had at least two meters in height. It either had black and big eyes, or no eyes at all. I turned to my cousin and said, Corre mano, which means rumbro in Portuguese. But he was already 20 meters away from me, where the street turned to the corner. So I ran too and we didn't speak about it until I got home. I still have no idea what the hell that was, and it's honestly to this day, the scariest experience of my life. This happened to me when I was 11 to 12 years old. I was walking with my friend in the woods in Texas, when suddenly I see a pitch white humanoid creature 
running on all fours at least four feet away from us. We were stunned, to say the least, and as we paid attention to its features, we grew ever more disturbed. Its jaw looked unhinged, with small, black, beady eyes, and its neck was extremely saggy like that of a rooster. It was scrawny and malnourished looking, and had long, black claws that were at least three to four inches long. I didn't stay too long for a good look, since the moment after we saw it, we ran out of the woods in a full sprint, panicking. We made it home safely, and both of us saw it clearly, and neither of us have the slightest idea whatever the hell it is. If anyone has any information regarding this creature, I would love to know, as it has left me perplexed for the longest time. I'm from a small village in northern Cambodia, with no clean water, and we live in run-down houses. In order to get to the nearest town, where there's actually a big store and a supermarket and stuff like that, we have to walk miles to get there. I want to share with you a story that happened when I was around five or six years old. My mother left me and my brothers home alone to go out drinking. While she was out, we decided to play in the back garden. Nothing unusual there. About half an hour into our game, we see a figure looming in the distance. We were really young, so obviously we didn't think to run away or anything. Until it approached and we saw what it actually was. Now in Cambodia, there are a number of urban legends, one of these being the Ap. She is basically a female spirit who manifests as a beautiful woman, but with her organs hanging out from her head and neck, and moves by hovering slowly above the ground. You guessed it. The thing that was approaching us was the Ap. It was terrifying. Her long black hair swaying gently in the wind, with blood and other fluids dripping from her organs, and her smile. Her smile was truly horrifying. I picked up my youngest brother as best I could, and we ran inside. I tried to block the door, but obviously did not do a very good job. None of us slept that night. We were way too scared. But we were also too afraid to call for help and just hid in a corner praying for our mother to come home. Eventually she did, and we tried to tell her that she wouldn't believe us. She thought we had just left our imaginations to get the better of us. I want to believe that it was fake somehow, and that it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but she was so real, unwitnessed by me and my brothers. It's the most terrifying experience I've ever had, and no one will believe me. I appreciate the entire story sounds like a really bad horror movie, but it wasn't. I really wish it was, though. It has been 13 years since this event took place, and I still get nightmares about it. When I was 12 or so and visiting our holiday home, I saw a person slash being in our neighbor's yard. He was a humanoid in most ways, but his skin was grey like concrete and super wrinkly. Not like a very old person, but rather he had few but large wrinkles like a wrinkly dog. Suddenly he looks up and stares at me. This is when I notice his unusual skin and I freeze as well. We stare at each other for a few seconds before he scurries away and disappears behind the house. And it wasn't in the middle of the night or a dark, secluded, creepy place. It was the middle of the day. It was sunny, and there were other people around, but no one else noticed him. Later that day, when the sun had just started to set, I saw him again. I had just stepped out the house, and he was standing in our neighbor's yard again, seemingly waiting for me. We were just looking at each other for a minute or so. He seemed to try and determine whether or not I was a threat. I was trying to do the same with him. Finally, he settled on not, and turned around and vanished behind their house again. That was 16 years ago, 
and I've never seen him since. Even though I've been there many times, I've never heard anyone else talk about seeing something similar either. A few years back, pre-COVID, I had agreed to meet up with some friends in the States to go on a road trip. There were a bunch of locations we wanted to hit up, most of them rural, and my friend had lots of experience driving through those areas. So off we went, having a merry time on the road. It was a very pleasant and overall enjoyable experience, being my first time in the States. But one thing happened one night that I don't think any of us will ever forget. We had definitely left it too late, choosing to have a late meal and chat for ages before we made it to our next destination. Problem was, one of our friends didn't exactly know how to get there, and the reception was really bad, so we were relying on maps and local knowledge to make our way there. It was around 2am at this point, and all of us were exhausted. The option to just pull up on the side of this road and hope for the best and try and sleep a few hours was discussed, but then declined. While we're driving slowly in the dark on this rural back road in the middle of I don't know where, suddenly we see a figure in our headlights. My friend thinks it's a deer and will just run off the road, and as we get closer it certainly looks like a deer. But as we get closer, it doesn't move, so my friend quickly pulls on the brakes because no one wants their car destroyed by a deer at 2am. Suddenly, as we slowly pull up near the deer, the creature starts standing up on its hind legs. It turns its head and looks straight towards us, and I swear at that moment, each member of the vehicle was about to crap themselves. I don't think I've ever felt such primal fear, because no one expected this thing to just stand up the way it did. It twisted its head to look at us, straight in the eyes it felt and then bolted, on back legs only, into the woods. Safe to say, we drove extremely fast until we made it to our destination, and neither of us spoke about it the whole way there. In fact, barely any words have been shared about the whole ordeal in the years since, and I don't think anyone is particularly keen on talking about it. Something happened that night that none of us can explain. I just thought I'd share it with you in case someone knows what the hell we saw that night. This happened when I was around 16 years old. I was in high school and living in my parents' ranch home in Western Pennsylvania. For several weeks, I would have a hard time falling asleep because every time I did, I would see this freakishly deformed black goat standing on two legs. It scared me, and I had several nightmares of this goat just slowly walking towards me. One night I was absolutely terrified, more so than usual. I decided to get up and use the restroom to see if that would help me relax and rest my brain so that I could try and get some shut-eye. I exited my bedroom. The living room was off to the right of the hallway and I just stopped and froze solid. There, in the blackness of my parents' living room, with a minuscule amount of moonlight shining through the triangular windows, was the goat man. He stood about six foot tall. He was menacing and felt dominating and evil. The most messed up part about this goat man was his front legs or arms. I don't even know what to call them as he stood on his hind legs, but his hands were hooves, but his elbows were broken. His hooves were upside down facing the ceiling, and he was moving slowly but in a dancing, swaying kind of way. I just dipped back into my room and closed my eyes and hid under the covers. I couldn't force myself to scream or face it any longer. I guess I just chose to ignore it. Luckily, I haven't seen this creature since, but I've told all of my friends and family about it. They, of course, think it's hilarious, but I do think they believe me. They will bring it up in conversations as a joke from time to time and laugh because they know it scares me. I know they mean well, but even a 28-year-old still gets goosebumps and the occasional tear to my eye, and I hope I never have a run-in with it again. A few years ago, I was riding in the back seat of a car with my boyfriend, with his two friends up in the front. We were driving through the back roads in the Catskills at night, 
with winding roads surrounded by forests and no street lights. At some point I noticed a figure to my left at the side of the road. It ran parallel to the vehicle for a moment and then cut across the road immediately in front of the vehicle. The problem was this thing was transparent, as in literally predator style. It seemed to have four legs and was about the height of a deer torso, but its legs were bulkier than that of a deer. It almost had a hunched over sort of gait. I knew I saw it, however impossible it may seem, and I knew the driver saw it because he braked. I knew the front passenger saw it because I saw him turn his head while the thing crossed the road. Still, I was sitting there questioning whether I should comment or not because what the hell? When my boyfriend spoke up and asked, did you guys see that? So we all saw it. And to this day, it remains one of the strangest outdoor experiences I have ever had. I spent a lot of my free time urban exploring. If you're not familiar with the concept, it involves finding abandoned buildings and, well, exploring them, as the name suggests. I know it doesn't sound like much fun, but living in an old college town, there isn't much fun to be had. See, I like to collect old relics. For example, recently I was exploring the old courthouse that was abandoned after they built a new one, and I found an old gavel. They're sort of like trophies for me. I was never very athletic or excelled in school, so I don't have a shelf of golden athletes captured in the middle of nicking or throwing a ball or framed certificates recognizing high grades. These were the old souvenirs I liked to show off. I usually do this alone, since no one in my small circle of friends is interested in this sort of thing. They tell me that it's creepy and they're afraid to go into old buildings at night. I tell them I always have a flashlight with me and plenty of batteries for backup, but that doesn't seem to bring them any comfort. I think I've seen too many scary movies, but don't get me wrong, I love the horror genre, but I don't take any of that to heart. I don't believe in the supernatural or ghosts or spooky things like that. I like to go at night because it provides plenty of cover in case the local police department decides they want to do some exploring of their own. Like I said earlier, I live in an old college town, and being of college age, you would think it would be easier to meet like-minded people that share the same sort of interests as I do. Apparently I've discovered a niche when it comes to hobbies. That was until I met Harley. I noticed her eating alone in our school dining hall and decided to try and strike up a conversation with her. I asked if I could sit down with her and she reluctantly accepted with what I thought was an eye roll. Either way, I took my seat and began asking her my best get to know you questions. It was exactly what you would expect given our surroundings. What's your name? Where are you from? What's your major? She was nice enough and answered my lame questions and returned a few of her own. I discovered she was from East Texas and came here to study music to become a band director for any high school that would hire her, as she put it. She was desperate to get out of her small town and move to the city where she would never have to see a pine tree again. I thought things were going really well, and then she asked me what my hobbies were. If I'm honest, I figured this would be where the conversation came to an end. I answered her question with barely any eye contact and some stammering. I told her about exploring and my collection of trophies, and to my surprise, she seemed kind of interested. She told me back home she was into paranormal investigations. I feigned interest, since I think all of that is bullshit to begin with, but she had pretty eyes and an amazing smile, and I guess my acting was pretty convincing since she asked if I wanted to join her soon on one of her investigations. I didn't really say yes, but I didn't say no either. I asked her where she was interested in going next, and she asked me if I'd ever heard of Goatman Bridge. I'd lived near this town my whole life. Of course I'd heard of Goatman's Bridge. I've just never been there. If you aren't familiar with this local legend, I'll fill you in. The story goes that there was a goat farmer by the name of Oscar Washburn in the 1930s, who made a living by selling meat, milk, cheese, and hides. He apparently did really well for himself and his family, 
and this did not settle well with the local KKK. You had to cross what is known as the Old Alton Bridge to get to his farm. So to help his business, Washburn posted a sign on the bridge that read, This way to the goat man. Well, this must have been the final straw for the local assholes, because late one night they broke into his home, dragged him to the old bridge where they had a noose waiting for him, and mercilessly tightened the noose around his neck and flung him over the side of the bridge. When they went down to the riverbank below to confirm their murderous deed, they found nothing but the empty noose and undisturbed waters. Confused and still in a blind rage, they went back to Oscar's farm and burnt it to the ground with his family still inside. Oscar's body was never found or seen again. My cell phone rang later that night and honestly I was kind of surprised to see it was Harlan. I tried to answer with my smoothest, hey, how's it going? She laughed at my attempt and told me she was going to Goatman Bridge and wanted to know if I would like to join her. I told her I was free as I closed my textbook and put my homework on pause. She told me she would be at my place in 20 minutes, so I got dressed, grabbed my backpack in case I found any souvenirs. My hopes were low for this, but you never know. I hadn't told Harlan yet that I didn't believe in the paranormal or a spiritual realm, whatever you want to call it. I figured I would let her know about my skepticism at a later date. I get a text letting me know that she's waiting for me outside, so I head out the door and get into her car, throwing my bag into the back seat. As soon as she starts driving to the destination of Goatman's Bridge, she begins to unload about how excited she is for this. There's nothing like this back in East Texas. It's all haunted houses with tales of Confederate soldiers or someone's dead grandma lurking in the attic. How boring. So what are you hoping to find? Are you kidding? I want to see the goat man. See him? I thought you just said that seeing old dead spirits is boring. She shoots me an eye glance. I thought you knew all about the legend. She sarcastically mocked. I gave her a confused glance. She rolled her eyes and explained that this one is different. She said that she's never hunted a vengeful spirit before and she believes they're easier to communicate with. But if his body was never found, then how are you sure there's even a spirit to communicate with? She went on to explain that something happens that's beyond our understanding when someone is murdered, and with that much hate, a piece of them is left behind that wants revenge. And exactly why would you want to mess with someone who's that angry? I ask, surprising myself that I'm even entertaining the thought that a ghost can hold a grudge. Spirits can't hurt the living, she stated. We had to take a back road since the bridge had been shut down ever since they built a new one and we parked at the orange and white roadblock and got out of the car to make the trek to the bridge. It was dark. I know that's an obvious statement, but this was a kind of dark I hadn't seen before. I could see the stars that I'd never seen before, but I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I grab a flashlight from my bag, as does Harlan, from hers. We turn them on with what seemed like the loudest click my flashlight has ever made, and that's when I noticed how silent it was. I couldn't hear any wind or animals or crickets chirping. It was eerie to say the least. What's in your bag? I asked Harlan to break the silence. Oh, just some EVP equipment, thermal cameras, you know, just some basic ghost hunting tools. Sounds like you're ready to start your own TV show, I chuckled. If looks could kill, I would have been dead where I stood. She didn't appreciate that one. Those shows are all BS. They don't know what they're doing. I could see she was passionate about this, so I didn't push it any further. Then, she fixed her flashlight on the old bridge. Her pace increased, and I tried to keep up as she reached it before I could. This was your typical old bridge. Concrete road with steel beams coming up and over the road in a crisscross pattern. I couldn't tell if the beams were supposed to be red or just rusted over time. I scanned the bridge for the this way to the goat band sign I was hoping for, but no luck. I noticed Harlan reached for her cell phone in a back pocket. Just in time, she said with a smile on her face. Just in time for what? Just in time to summon the goat man, she said with way more enthusiasm than I expected. Summon? I thought it was just some ghost 
that hung around the bridge. You're making this sound like a demon or something. I began feeling a bit uneasy. What, well, are you scared? Harlan asked with a smile across her face. Look, these things usually end up being nothing. Best case scenario, we pick up an EVP or catch something on my thermal camera. Okay. Well, how do you summon the goat man? I was poorly hiding my nervousness in my voice. The legend says that if you knock three times on the steel beam exactly at midnight, he'll appear. I look at my phone to see that we're about five minutes from midnight. Harlan begins unpacking some equipment from her bag. She sets her thermal camera up on a tripod facing the opposite direction from which we approach the bridge. She turns on some special voice recorder and I tried explaining it to me, but I didn't really follow what she was saying. She checks the camera one more time to make sure it's just right. She approaches one of the now ominous looking red steel beams with her phone in one hand and the other balled into a fist and raised just above her head waiting to strike the steel at exactly midnight. I'm standing a few feet away from her, frozen with uncertainty about what's about to happen. The eerie silence is suddenly broken when Harlan knocks three times on the steel beam, each resounding with an echoing metallic bang that seems to go on forever. We both hold our breath, waiting for something to happen, but we only hear more silence. I start to move my flashlight off of Harlan towards the surrounding trees. I turn in a full circle before returning my flashlight back to her and I can see the disappointment written all over her face. I start to suggest that we go hit a bar and let me buy her a few drinks, but I barely get the words out my mouth before we hear a loud crack in the trees. The kind of sound you hear when something heavy steps on a dried twig. We both jumped and trained our flashlights on where the sound came from, yet for some reason we were facing the opposite direction from each other. I was facing the east side of the bridge and she the west. We both exchanged confused glances as to how this could have happened. Why was she facing the other direction when clearly the sound was from behind me? I wish that had remained the worst thing about this experience, but things got worse, way worse. While we were trying to figure out why the other one was wrong, we heard the most grim sound come from all around us. It started quietly at first and grew louder and louder. It was the scream of a goat, but not just a goat. It sounded like a goat and a man was screaming together at the same time, but from the same source, as if they were one. I kept trying to figure out which direction the sound was coming from, but the more I moved across the bridge, the more the screams seemed to move with me, like the sound was coming from the east and the west side of the bridge at the same time. Harlan and I seemed to meet in the middle of the bridge just behind our camera. That's when all the screaming seemed to meet at the same location. We both spun around to train our flashlights on the sound, and that's when we saw him, or whatever this thing was. It was a man, well at least the body was, and there were two legs, a torso, and two arms with human hands on each end, all of which were covered in muscles that seemed to flex and retract with every breath this thing took. Its breathing was loud, much louder than any human I've ever heard but that may be due to the fact that this thing did not have the head of a human. Instead, sitting on top of this thing's shoulders was the head of a goat, and not a small goat. This thing was in proportion to the rest of its body. The fur was deep black with solid eyes to match. Two massive horns protruded from its skull and pointed towards the back of its head. Two large ears just sat beneath its horns, jutting straight out. The most disturbing thing about all of this had to be where the goat head met the human body. It seemed to have been crudely stitched together. Each point where the needle would have met skin was still bleeding, as if it had recently been created or the wounds just never healed. I noticed Harlan was no longer watching the beast, but instead looking down at her thermal camera to see if it was picking this up. I could see her eyes widen when she realized it was. Something like this would make her famous, and most likely ignite the world of paranormal investigation. Our attention was quickly taken away from the camera and focused back on the goat man when it let out another horrifying scream, its mouth wide, exposing its long yellow teeth and lengthy black tongue. When it finished its deafening scream, it charged towards us. I immediately turned and bolted for the car. Harlan, however, tried to grab her camera before running away. Leave it, I screamed. 
just as she picked up the camera and turned to run. The goat man grabbed her by the back of the neck with a grip that she would have not have been able to break free from. I thought he would come for me too, but he just stopped and stared at me, with Harlem writhing and screaming in his grasp. I stood frozen, wanting to help her but knowing there was nothing I could do. I didn't carry weapons with me, and I don't think weapons would help in a situation like this. She locked eyes with me with this face that I'll never forget. Her face conveyed a look of pure terror that I've never seen before. The goat man quickly turned and ran back to the woods, dragging her behind him. Her screams got worse when she realized there was a fate coming that we were both unsure of. I know the sensible thing would have been to get into the car and drive far away from here, but I couldn't bring myself to leave without her. I started chasing after Harlan and the goat man crossing the bridge and heading into the woods. There was no path to follow, so all I was doing was following her screams. I ran for what felt like an eternity, but I could feel my lungs burning and my sides beginning to cramp. I could hear the screaming getting closer and louder, so I must have been heading in the right direction even though I had lost all sense of it. I came to an abrupt halt when I entered a small clearing. Oh God, what I saw next nearly made me puke. In the clearing was one giant oak tree surrounded by what must have been a dozen of these goat people holding torches and making the same noise the goat man was making on the bridge. Except these weren't screams like we heard earlier, but more like a chanting, as if I had stumbled into some sort of ritual. Sitting upright at the base of the tree was Harlan, but she was no longer screaming. In fact, she was no longer doing anything at all. I couldn't tell if she was dead or just unconscious, her body limp against the tree. I saw one of these goat people enter the circle walking towards her, and I realized it was the one we saw on the bridge. He wasn't holding a torch like the others. He was holding up the head of a goat, like it was a prized possession. The chanting seemed to get louder and faster the closer he got to her. When he was standing over her unconscious body, he brought the goat's head down with enough force to make Harlan's head disappear inside of it, as if she was wearing a Halloween mask. When he reached to the tip of one of the horns and snapped off a piece of a couple of inches long and began to sew the severed head onto Harlan's skin. There seemed to be some sort of sinewy thread attached to the end as he broke it off and I could hear the sickening sound of his horn piercing her skin and this thread being pulled through the wound. When he was finished, he put the thread in his mouth and used his teeth to bite off the sinew. He stuffed what was left back into his horn. The chanting from the onlooking goat people grew to the level where it seemed to be coming from all around. The goat man placed his hand on Harlan's forehead, or what was now her forehead, and let out a deep guttural yell. As I watched her body come to life slowly, her hands feeling her new goat head, she let out what seemed like a scream of sadness and disbelief. Her mouth, open, revealed the same rotting teeth and black tongue. She slowly rose to her feet and took in her surroundings and what I assumed was her new family. Her head jerked towards me as she pointed in my direction. They all turned to look at me, and I knew I had to get out of there. I wasted no time in turning and running away as fast as I could. I wasn't sure if I was heading in the right direction, but I could hear their voices in the distance behind me and I just kept running. I couldn't let them turn me into one of those things. I somehow found the bridge again and realized that I could no longer hear them behind me. I raced to Harlan's car and jumped inside. Thank God she left the keys in the ignition. The engine came to life with a roar and I threw it into drive and took off. I didn't stop for any red lights nor stop signs. It was late at this point, so there wasn't anyone on the road anyway. I drove back to my place and now I'm sharing this with you to make sure no one tries to find the goat man. No matter what you hear, stay away from the bridge. I'm still shaking and can't calm down. See, the thing is, and maybe I'm just going crazy, but I swear if I'm really quiet, I can hear a goat's bleat in the distance. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to every member and patron everyone whose name is on screen. You guys mean the world to me and your donations make so much difference. Honestly, thank you. Um, 
If you enjoyed tonight's video, please do let me know in the usual way. One thing that I've been seeing a lot in the comments is people saying about stuff you've experienced. I would love to hear about it if you've got a scary story of your own. The info to uh, send it to me is in the description. Just email it to themortismedia.gmail.com or post it in my Reddit. Both links, as I just said, are in the description. But I hope to see you again soon. Um, new video coming out on Saturday. Big compilation, probably three hours, 33 minutes and 33 seconds long, as is custom. So I hope to see you then. And if not, I'll probably see you next week. But until then, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.